bit in awe at the moment, I have to say, because, you know, there's so many fantastic stories in this room, and all that I've got to do is to tell you our story and our journey, but I hope it will give you a feel of why, for us in Tobin, and this is probably the most important thing that we've ever done, and how much I am in debt to locality for helping us make it a reality and giving us hope that there's more people than just ourselves who think the world's slightly mad and that we need to rethink our relationships with those people that have so far been making the frameworks of our lives which just seem to be breaking down. So here's a quick whiz through, a load of pictures about what our story is all about. First of all, we kick off in a place like Tobberdon. Tobberdon, as you can see, is, you know, it's got a place of, it's a place of challenges. It's not the most immediate place that you'd think of that would want to start a revolution around food. But what we planned to do six years ago, for reasons that I'll explain in a minute, is turn it from a place that looked like this to a place that looks like this, with not instant sunshine, I have to admit, but with fruit and vegetables and herbs growing all over the place in the middle of our town. And the reason we started to do this was that six years ago, we decided that we were deeply concerned about the decisions that were made on our behalf, about the use of resources that were being consumed on our behalf, and that that sense of lacking of real passion and leadership around the urgency of us readdressing our relationship with the environment and the planet and thinking about our children, our children's future and what we were leaving to them. And, you know, there just came a point six years ago when we thought, enough of this negativity, we can't be bothered with it. So without any sort of a, a policy document, report, consultation or anything that would be terribly good practice, but we decided was far too long, we decided to invent a new proposition. A proposition which said, is it possible that we ourselves, in the town of Toppenham, of 16,000 people, could be an experiment? Could we find a way of, of, of creating a unifying language that could cross age, income, culture and ability, that helped us all think about our relationship with the spaces around us differently, our relationships with our communities differently, the way that we use our resources? Is it possible that we could find a way ourselves of believing in our own ability to be part of a solution under problem, to stop being a victim, to stop whinging on about somebody else's responsibility, and to start really believing that collectively we had power in our hands to change our future. And the answer, it seems to us, is that yes, we have been able to do that, and in a very small way, through the language of food, we're trying to demonstrate in very clear and simple language how we might build a more prosperous and kinder future. So the model is dead straightforward, and we just made it up on the back of a kind of, I would say fag packet, but I would, actually it was a serviette. Uh, and we could have done it all manner of ways, but we wanted to think, how do we live our lives, and how do we reflect that? And how, if we put local food at the heart of that, would that change the way that we actually act and behave and think? So if we imagine around the place that we know and we love and we bring our children up in, up in, whether it's a town, a neighbourhood, a village, whatever. If we put local food at the heart of our community, what we do in our front garden, our back garden, what we see along our high streets, when we go to the uh, post office, whatever it is, if food was at the heart of that, edible landscapes, would it help us think about our relationships with each other and our environment differently? Commun uh, learning, what's being taught in our schools. Is, if food was at the heart of the curriculum, what would that mean in terms of what our children might be able to achieve? And more importantly, I think, what about the lost arts that we've all got in our community that we've forgotten about? The arts of pickling and bottling and grafting and skinning rabbits or whatever else it might be. What if we had a conversation around that and linked that all to that idea of learning now and into the future? Would that, would that help us think differently about ourselves? And lastly, edible landscapes. You know, reconnecting through an appreciation of seasonality in local food. What would that mean about the way we spend our pound in a pocket? about business. Would it make us want to support local businesses more? Would it make us want to really fight for our local market? Not be opposed to something like our supermarket, but very strongly want to use our own buying power to create an alternative proposition that had a lot more legs and supported a lot more resilient local economies. So that was the proposition. Spin those three plates together and see what you can do around a town like Todmorden, and then just see if you can spread it. Some pictures of what we've done. First of all, and it helps if you don't ask people permission very often, because if you do, it takes you a lot longer to get to where you need to get to. And my view is, on the whole, if they like to say no, don't bother. Just carry on. Because eventually, they'll really want to say yes, and that makes them feel a lot better about themselves. So we took what was basically a dog toilet on the side of the road, the top 
right hand picture is, is what it was about. People just let their dogs go there, therefore they threw the cans, therefore nobody respected that space. So we moved into the space, we put our gloves on, we got all the rubbish out of it, we replanted it with herbs and fruit and all the rest of it. Because every single one of these gardens, which we call propaganda gardens, is about food for sharing. Not because we're completely barking and we think we can feed 16,000 people with these spaces, but because it creates a sense of possibility about what we ourselves can actually achieve, even in a wet climate like Tomadon. So we turned it into a fantastic herb garden, and the really interesting thing about that is it does change people's behaviour. Because not only do they not have their dogs there or throw their cans down there, but the local authority eventually mows it and puts a bench there so that people can enjoy it. And we never asked them to do that, but it was their part. You, bake, you take a gift so far, and they meet you halfway. It happens all the time in the last six years. Mary's garden. Mary, the lady that I kicked all this thing off with, took down the front wall in her garden, put a big sign up there, took up all um, the plants that you couldn't eat, replanted it with the plants that you can eat, and suddenly we've got another propaganda garden, which is right at the bottom of a hill that leads up to one of our estates. Again, interesting behavioural shift. We invite people to come and help themselves to this food, but of course, it takes a good while for people to be brave enough to actually do that, because we've become a society that says, get off, that's mine. Eventually people do, and often it's children. And a lady that was going backwards and forwards to a school did climb over to the wall, did pick the herbs, did help herself to some of the vegetables, and then went home. And that was absolutely perfect. But the story I tell on this is the one that I know is about that food can change people's lives. Eventually, they came back. They put the outer leaves of the cabbage in the compost bin, and that was absolutely fine because the school had taught them to do that. But the next morning, on Mary's doorstep, was a bowl of soup left by the people who had collected those herbs, complete strangers, saying thank you back to someone who'd given them something. And that was the start of how we started to reconnect communities. And all we're doing is, as volunteers, planting veg. And then we've got the health centre. Well, this is completely mad, isn't it? So you build a £6 million health centre, you surround it with prickly plants, and you want to actually help people think more healthily about what they're eating. None of those prickly plants are edible. You then run an alternative, parallel, universe, multi-million pound programme that says eat five a day. Well, let me give government a suggestion. <laughs> what you ought to actually do is pull up all those prickly plants that we do and replant apples and pears and raspberries and strawberries and herbs. We've done that at the front. We've got an apothecary garden at the back. The doctors did let us do that as long as they didn't have to pay and they didn't have to do anything, but, which is absolutely fine. And now we have an edible landscape that people, irrespective of age, income, culture and ability can walk through and feel healthy and taste the raspberries and eat the strawberries and suddenly start to understand not all food comes in a plastic bag from a supermarket. That's the point of this. People rediscovering for themselves a different way to make them and their family healthier. And then the dear old job centre. Well, it looked that thing in the top right hand corner. That's what it looked like. I mean, how depressing is that? So we planted up the front of that. They asked us to do it in the first place. We did it in the middle of winter. We've now got edible stuff that people are stopping, they're tasting, they're thinking, they're connecting with us about what skills they can get so that they can do this in their own backyard and maybe, just maybe, thinking about a new future for themselves. And then the college. Again, we made some enemies here. We took up all the <laughs> roses at the front of the college and we planted edibles. But again, it's on a high street. People stop, they have a conversation, they talk to complete strangers and suddenly they remember the past, they think about the future and it starts to reconnect people who've never talked to each other before. And then we've got the good old police station, just because you could have a laugh. So basically the police station was just a dead space in front of where they uh, did their work. So we planted up sweet corn and all manner of things. And now on the police's own statistics, environmental damage in the middle of the town has never been lower and community relations have never been better. And it's all because we're creating edible landscapes in the heart of the town. We regularly host visits from police constables from all over the north of England who wander around. You do not need a multi-million pound campaign to make your communities feel Feel, feel safer and happier. You just need to re-engage in really creative ways. And then the railway car park. You know, if we want people to visit our town and we want them to do that sustainably, a car park's a great place to start. So we took over a corner of a bed in that car park at the railway station and we dug out all the rubbish and we put a membrane in there. We got a bit of funding from a local campaign that we'd been running. We also got some wood from a local demolition yard and we built that and it turned into that. So people get off the trains, they pick some herbs, they pick some rocket, they, and do you know if they take the entire bed of potatoes, it's because they want to eat it, so the moral of that is plant more potatoes, it's not rocket science. And that, so that's the edible landscapes that we've created in our lives. And what about learning? Well, we work with very small people, we work with slightly bigger people who like to pretend they're bees and butterflies for all the reasons in the room that we need to know that. 
We get some boats that we're going to dump in Halifax because there were some holes in them and we give each one to a school so that kids can have a different place in which to grow. It's not all about the conventional plots. We've then taken over some, some areas such as this, which is a disused tennis court next to one of our schools. Lots of raised beds there for some of the people in the purest, com poorest communities. And yes, they're growing veg, but actually they're growing friendship at the same time. And that's been really important to us. We then take over unusual spaces. One of, our, one of our schools in the middle of the town is right next to a cemetery, and they don't have any land. So we did ask the people at the cemetery, would they mind? And they said, yo, that's absolutely all right, as long as we don't have to pay, and we don't have to do it, so that's absolutely fine. And now we have a kids' club there in the cemetery. Obviously, I always say this, but it's true, the soil is really good, but what's really important... <laughs> What's really important is those kids are no longer afraid of those spaces that represented something negative. They can see it as something positive. And all the way through, this is what food is allowing us to do. It is the medium for change. Because of the passion in our communities, we persuaded the local authority way back when there was a diploma in, uh, in environmental science and, and land technology that our local high school, which has many challenges, would be a centre for a BTEC in agriculture. And now kids that were going out of that school with no qualifications whatsoever are now going out, potentially, as the farmers of the future. And one of the great things that we've been able to do in partnership with a social enterprise is to create demonstration aquaponics units so that those kids in that high school who felt that they had nothing to offer are now thinking about some cutting-edge food technology that can be introduced. And quite honestly, if 40% of our food is going to come from urban areas, we need these young people and we need to invest in them. And then we've got the other lost arts. We've got, you know, community bakeries kicking off because we worked on the estates with a come down with me. And we just make it up as we go along. That's the great thing about this. We do not have to rely on anybody else's permission nine times out of ten. Or we teach people how to graft trees because we want community orchards everywhere it costs. So how are you going to keep costs down? You graft the trees yourself. And then, of course, one of the great things is one of the spin-offs is out of the blue, the, the, the local scouts say, we really love what you're doing, can we create an incredible edible badge? We say that's fantastic, and now they're seeking national funding so that we're going to have a national incredible edible badge for young people to believe in themselves that they can change their future, even if it's just through food and business. Well, farmers are really important to us because if we're going to create local resilient economies, which is part of what we're actually trying to do, because it makes sense, because, you know, the rest of the stuff, the globalisation stuff, falling off a cliff. And I'd like to think in the future that our kids have got some, you know, somewhere that they could really get a job and feel they're contributing back, making that money sticky in the local economy. So we spoke to the local farmers. We said, we really want to support you to do more local food on the market. They thought we were mad and they left the room. So we thought, we're not going to be stalled with that. So we created a campaign. The campaign was called Every Egg Matters. And basically, it was, could we create a loyalty around one product that those farmers would start to say, I get it, that community really does want to support us. So we did a stylized map of Tottenham. We put the blobs on there for people that were selling eggs to each other because they had a few chickens in the backyard. We started with four. We've got 64 now. What happens? Well, people go into their shops. They say, I want, is that egg from a Tottenham farmer? Well, from a Tottenham hen, obviously. And that... that <laughs> not got to that stage yet. Um, and that shopkeeper says yes or no or whatever, but then they have a word with the farmer, and that farmer ups the amount of free-range hens that they might have to produce that. And then when that goes well, they up the amount of free-range birds for meat, and so on and so forth. And from these really simple community beginnings, we start to see the beginning of a local food economy. We've got a local market. It's dead on its feet all but one day. So we give them all a free notice board. It costs us 15 quid each to raise money for that. And on that, incredible edible tod at the top, they scribble on whatever they're doing, bread, beer, meat, cheese. And people start a conversation around their stall and they start to support them because they know where the food's coming from. And as a result of that, we've got local food into most of our cafes. We've got a new cheese producer. We've got more pickles and beers and God knows what that you can shake a stick at. We are not Ludlow. This is still Tomadon. But we are starting very slowly to recreate the belief that we can inspire more people to be local food entrepreneurs. And that was a survey done by a young man that came over from Italy for us because, you know, we do attract people from all over the world and it's a great blessing. And 50% of local businesses said that because of Incredible Edibles Blackboard, sales had increased. It's really small beginnings, but, you know, it gives us confidence that we have the power in our own, own hands to change the future. And if you join all those three dots together, you get something like this. We get the kids learning the BTEC. They become the apprentices. We are completely mad and we get some lottery money and we build an aquaponics, hydroponics and permaculture centre, which we opened, we could give you a real picture now, we opened it on Monday of this week. It's called our incredible 
aqua garden. It's a social enterprise, half community, half school, and it's a learning resource so that the, you know, the whole of the north of England could tap into this, do it for themselves, and start to understand that we don't have to wait for another government initiative. We have it in our own power to build that resilient local economy, reskill people, get people to actually work together more collectively. And on top of that, we've created another social enterprise, which is an incredible farm, and we just take opportunities. A local garden centre gave us a bit of uh, muddy land. We got some money from a community foundation. We put a fence around it because there's a lot of deers and rabbits and so on. And with the help of volunteers, and it's all volunteers, we've created community gardens and a market garden training centre. And between those two enterprises, we are employing four people and we've got four apprentices. Small beginnings, but it's given us confidence. And on top of that, we've invented a new form of tourism, which is called vegetable tourism. <laughs> and people from all over the world come along, quite often in winter, when there's nothing in the raised beds whatsoever, and poke around, because they want to. They want to do something. They don't know about what to do about sustainability, or climate change, or fiscal cliffs, or anything like that. But they do know how to feed their family, and they do know that by starting really small, whether it's a window box or something on the main street, that they can start a conversation that is positive and not negative. So what could we do for our vegetable tourists? Well, we could create a healthy route. And so we created this, again, all done by volunteers. It starts off at the railway station, and it takes you past all the edible gardens. These are people from Venezuela. They start at, the, this is the railway station. Then we move down past some work that the local artists have done, which have put bird, bee, and bat boxes along the route so it makes it jolly. And again, don't ask people, just put them up in the middle of the night. <laughs> And then we went down to the boat larder, which is basically our canal towpath, which was a dog toilet, and we created it into a place that has herbs and fruit and vegetables for a good stretch of it. And what happens is people pull up their boats and they start to pick some of those. And as long as they water them in return or replant the last one, we're more than happy to supply anybody that wants to come along. And this is part of that incredible edible towpath. And on our high street, we didn't do this, but because the local um, businesses themselves like it, they've started to put raised beds in front of their shops along the high street. So they're growing things, where, whether that's beans or kale or herbs or whatever. So again, once you start to work out the bit of the thread that you yourself can start to pull, you can do all manner of things. And lastly, in terms of Pollination Street, this was a hoarding in the middle of the town. The council dropped it, but it was a health centre, and they put a hoarding around it at the start of the recession, just when that market hall there on the right was desperately trying to, you know, re-establish itself. So eventually we persuaded the local authority to drop the hoarding, provided that we would replant that corner. We made up the name Pollination Street. That isn't a real beehive and that isn't a real street sign because we put that there as well. And now what we've got in the middle of town is a place where people can actually smell and eat the apples and the rhubarb and the other things we've planted. And this is what it looks like now and it's a green space. And after a few years of doing that, the local authority now are getting that we've now got a community village green, if you like, in the middle of Tobinan, and people are fighting that it remains that way because it makes us all feel so much better to be able to see that than just a dead hoarding. And sharing the journey, we've got these blobs all over the country, and locality have been absolutely key in helping us make this a reality. We've got people working in Prestwich. We've got people working in the Isle of Wight. We've got 54 communities all over the place creating edible landscapes, reskilling themselves, creating social enterprises, and it's an absolute delight to work with them. We've got clock mills where uh, Catholic and Protestant are working together for the first time through their children to re-establish a food economy. Salford's fantastic. Edible York right in the middle. Leeds City Hall planted up some fabulous stuff which is all about edible and communities and reconnecting to growing right in the heart of where we are. And visitors from all over the world, we've reconnected with them. France has gone completely ballistic, obviously. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that, you, again, through the help of locality, we have now established an incredible edible network. Teachers talking to teachers, housing associations to housing associations, communities to communities. Not asking anybody's permission, just getting on with sharing that great practice that you know, is all the difference in making our lives kinder and more prosperous. And at the end of the day, the one message we leave with everybody, which everybody in this room has signed up to, is believe in the power of small actions. It can really change your world. That's incredible. Edible Tom. Thank you. Thank you.